Hello and good afternoon friends, welcome to the CC Educate Live Lecture. Dear friends, with our ongoing series on development biology, today we would be talking on embryonic induction and neurulation and for this discussion we have once again with us in our studios Dr. Charu Dogra Rawat. Dr. Charu Dogra Rawat is Assistant Professor in Department of Zoology, Ramjas College, University of Delhi. So let's welcome our guest Dr. Charu Dogra Rawat and let's take forward our series on development biology forward. Hello ma'am, welcome to the Educate Lecture. Thank you Geetika. Uh, so we have seen uh, till now that you know the uh, cell morph morphogenetic movements have started and the formation of the three germ layers has occurred. So now the three germ layers have to give rise to the organ structures, the tissues and the organ structures and they are very coordinated in their formation. So an important aspect in the formation of tissues and organs is that there is a cell-cell communication. There is a process by which each cell, you know, kind of in some of the organisms and in some, uh, they kind of induce the other cells to become certain kind of structures and this happens in a very coordinated manner so that the organs and higher order structures can be formed. So today we will talk about this embryonic induction and the formation of the neural tube. So the specific learning objectives for this session would be to understand the mosaic and regulative development to understand the embryonic induction, the modes and different types of inductive interactions, to understand the interactive interactions in amphibians and to understand the concept of organizer. So we will look at a number of experiments that were done to prove the identity of this organizer which exists in the uh, developmental stages. So to start with, we will review just some of the terms that there are four stages by which the pluripotent cells of uh, of an epiblast or blastula gets uh, differentiated into uh, certain precursor cells such as neuroblasts or muscle cells etc. And these four stages are the competence wherein the cells can become some precursor if they are exposed to the appropriate combination of signals, specification wherein cells have received the appropriate signals to become the precursor. But progression along the differentiation pathway can still be repressed by other signals. Determination wherein the precursor have entered a differentiation pathway and will become the distinct tissue even in the presence of inhibitory signals. And differentiation wherein the cells leave the mitotic cycle and express those genes characteristic of their cell type. Now specification and determination is basically clubbed together to form what is called as commitment. Specification is a little labile phase, the commitment can be reversed in this particular case, you know there are signals which are there, there are inhibitory signals which are there and it can be reversed. But once a cell is determined to become a certain precursor cell then that is you know in normal development it is irreversible. So we say that a cell is committed to a particular fate and when it undergoes different differentiation pathways then it becomes the certain precursor cells. Now based upon this commitment there are different modes of commitment or the modes of cell type specification and thereby the different types of development. And these are first is termed as the autonomous specification. Now autonomous specification is the characteristic of most invertebrates. The specification is by differential acquisition of certain cytoplasmic molecules present in the egg or these are also called as the morphogenic determinants. So certain morphogenic determinants are already present in the egg and that determines the fate of the cell. Invariant cleavages produce the same lineages in each embryo of the species. The blastomere fates are generally invariant. So right at the you know single cell even one cell embryo stage or even when the blastulation is occurring the cell fates are determined. They are committed to form a certain fate and because of this it produces what is called as a mosaic or determinative development that cells cannot change fate if a blastomere is lost. So if a blastomere is lost the, uh, the fate you know what it is going to become that structure will be lost and it will not be formed again. 
So this type of give rise to you know kind of a mosaic tile arrangement because it is specified the, that each of the cell is like you know it is going to become a or going to attain a particular fate which is there and if one is missing then it is generally missing. Another kind of specification is conditional specification. It is characteristic of all vertebrates and few invertebrates. The specification is by interaction between the cells and the relative positions are important. So, regional specificity is there and the specification is by interaction. So, today we are going to you know this is the focus of our session today the inductive interactions. So, there is a cell cell communication that occurs. The variable cleavages produce no variant fate assignment to the cells and the capacity for regulative development allows cells to acquire different functions. So, if a particular cell blastomere is lost, the other blastomeres take up its function and still give rise to a or still undergoes the normal development. So, it is not that the blastomere that is lost that kind of structure does not appear. It does appear and the rest of the uh, rest of the cells or blastomeres take up that function. Another kind of uh, specification occurs in most insect classes and it is termed as syncytial specification. The specification of body regions by interaction between cytoplasmic regions prior to cellularization of the blastoderm. The various cleavages produce no rigid cell phase for particular nuclei. After cellularization conditional specification is most often seen. So, as we have seen in insects there is a superficial cleavage that occurs that in the cytoplasm the nuclei divide to produce a syncytium and later on the cytoplasmic bridges are formed and you know they fuse together to give rise to different cells. So, before cellularization there is a syncytium kind of an appearance which is there. And at that time the fate is actually not determined. So, variable cleavages produces no rigid cell fates for particular nuclei. However, when the cellularization occur usually they follow the determinate or the conditional uh, uh, space indeterminate or the regulative or the conditional specification which is there. So, we will start with looking at you know how did this mosaic and regulative development you know what are the experimental evidences for that. So, initially Weizmann gave a particular theory which came to be known as germplasm theory and he said based on the fate map of the frog embryo that when the first cleavage division separated the future right half of the embryo from the future left half there would be a separation of right determinants from left determinants in the resulting blastomeres. So, he speculated that you know right at the point when the first cleavage is occurring the cytoplasmic determinants are distributed and in different blastomeres they might be different or they might be equal distribution of the cytoplasmic determinants and these determinants give rise to the particular fate. So, this is a kind of a mosaic he speculated the mosaic development or the autonomous specification which is there. And Rauch's attempt to demonstrate mosaic development. So, experimental evidences came from the uh, experiments done by the scientist Rauch's and what he did was he took the fertilized frog egg and after the first cleavage at the two cell stage he just pricked one of the blastomeres with a hot needle and therefore it died. And later on what he saw was that at the neurula stage you can see that the, the right half which was the uh, you know which was the live uh, living tissue it gave rise to the neurula but half of the embryo developed and the part which was destroyed damaged by the hot needle it basically did not give rise to the embryo. So, it was basically a half embryo that appeared. So, cell fate was already determined the blastomere the lineage which was, which was used to coming from the dead tissue it was not formed in the adult or in the embryo for example, neurula states seen here. But the, the live blastomere did give rise to the half of the uh, neurulation half of the neural tube was formed. So, this was a direct evidence for mosaic development that is occurring. However, Hans Triesch also performed certain experiments and it was in favor of what is called as the regulative development or basically experimental evidences for regulative development. There are a series of experiments which are done in embryology. The first one which we talked about is a kind of a defect experiment in which one of the or damaged experiment in which half of the tissue for example, one of the blastomere was damaged and then its cell lineage was, uh, was uh, you know studied. 
Some other experiments are for example isolation experiments. So in isolation experiments what Hans Driesch did was that rather than cell, uh, he took this uh, uh, you know four uh, blastomere stage and after this four blastomere stage when he removed the fertilization envelope and he squeezed it into the and separated the individual four blastomeres and each blastomere then give rise to the normal pluteus larva. So you can see that one normal pluteus larva will be formed from the intact, uh, intact uh, you know cleavage, the intact embryo which is developing and when the four cells are separated, the four pluteus although they were not of the same size, but still the entire four pluteus, the complete larva could be formed. So rather than self differentiating into its future embryonic part, each isolated blastomere regulated its development so as to produce a complete organism. So this is an isolation experiment which gave a direct uh, uh, evidence that in each cell has the potential to develop into a uh, into a entire pluteus larva although when they were all together then they gave to the respective structures of a single pluteus larva which was there. The third kind of experiment which is performed is called as the recombination experiment and this experiment what he did was that you can see that there is a normal cleavage that is occurring and in the normal cleavage the two divisions are meridional and one of the then the third division is equatorial dividing it into the upper half and the lower half. So after the second division it was squeezed between the blastula was squeezed between the glass plate and the third equatorial division also become meridional division. So when this meridional division occurred then actually the neighbor of the cells was uh, differing now because upper part was the entire blue and the lower part was entire but in this case you can see the alternative bands which, bands which is there. So the relative position of a blastomere within the hole will probably in a general way determine what shall come of it. So in this case the fate of these cells were altered because now they were in contact with some other cells rather than when they are in the normal development case. So this uh, you know the, the conclusion was basically that the relative position of the blastomere within the hole will probably in a general way determine what shall come from it. So this is a summary of the experiments performed by Raus, Raux and Driesch and you can see that the Raux presented the defect experiment and the Driesch did the isolation and the recombination experiment and the conclusion for this experiment which he did in case of frog was the mosaic development or autonomous specification and important interpretation concerning the potency and the fate. So these two terms are very important, potency means that the cell has potential to develop into some structures and fate is the outcome you know what it will become. So when there is a mosaic development the prospective potency equals prospective fate. So its potential is whatever it is potential is it achieves that as an outcome in the fate. In the regulative development or conditional specification however the prospective potency is greater than the prospective fate. The prospective potency is much larger and therefore one single cell can give rise to multiple fates depending upon the conditions which are presented. And similarly the recombination experiment which he did in sea urchin again the prospective potency is greater than the prospective fate which is there. So regulative development is very important concept wherein an isolated blastomere has a potency greater than its normal embryonic fate. And a cell's fate is determined by interactions between the neighboring cells and such interactions are called as inductions. The interaction at close range between two or more cells or tissues of different history and properties is called as the proximate interaction or induction. The two components to every inductive interaction is that there is an inducer, the tissue that produces a signal that changes the cellular behavior of the other tissue. And there is a responder, the tissue that is being induced. Not all tissues can respond to the signal being produced by the inducer and this ability to respond to a specific inductive signal is called competence. So when we looked at the four stages by which the pluripotent cell was giving rise to a precursor cell, the first stage was the competence. And competence basically means that particular tissue can respond to certain kind of signals only. And this stage, the competence stage, it is not a passive stage, but it is also an actively acquired condition. So the cell has to be competent enough and therefore it will perceive the signal coming from the other cell and will then specify its fate 
determined to become its fate and then finally undergo the differentiation, differentiation pathway to become a particular precursor cell which is formed. So, competence is very important to understand. Many inductive interactions are reciprocal in nature. So, which basically means that one cell can induce the other cell and then the other cell can also induce the first cell to become something. So, inductive interactions are reciprocal as well as sequential which basically means that and there are multiple causes for each induction. So, one cell can induce the other cell to become something and then the other cell further goes and become the Third, uh, influences the third cell to become. So, it is kind of a sequential event. It can be reciprocal or there can be or and, pro and probably there is not always only a single signal that will induce a cell to become uh, to have a particular fate, but there might be multiple signals that will uh, cause the cell to become a to attain its particular fate which is there. Now, the modes of inductive interactions were uh, work was done by Howard Holzer in 1968 and he distinguished between two different types of inductive interactions. One is called as an instructive interaction, a signal from the inducing cell is necessary for initiating new gene expression in the responding cell. Without the inducing cell, the responding cell would not be capable of differentiating in that particular way. For example, when the optic vesicle is experimentally placed under a new region of the head ectoderm and causes that region of the ectoderm to form a lens, that is a kind of an instructive interaction. So, there has to be an inducer for the responder cell to respond, otherwise it will not attain its particular fate. Another kind of interaction is permissive interaction. The responding tissue contains all the potential that are to be expressed and needs only an environment that allows the expression of these traits. For, uh, for instance, many tissues need a solid substrate containing fibronectin or lemonin in order to develop. The fibronectin or lemonin does not alter the type of the cell that is to be produced, but only enables what has been determined to be expressed. So, the cell has its own potential. It does not need any kind of uh, instructive instructions from you know any other cell, but it just needs for example, a substratum for them to be determined and therefore, differentiated into a particular type of cell. Now, how are these signals between inducer and responder transmitted? There are two main ways. One, when cell membrane proteins on one cell surface interact with receptor proteins on adjacent cell surfaces, then these events are called as juxtacrine interactions since the cell membranes are juxtaposed. So, one of the mode by which an inducer can induce a responsive cell, a competent cell is by this juxtacrine interactions. Another mechanism is by paracrine interactions that when proteins synthesized by one cell can diffuse over small distances to induce changes in neighboring cells, the event is called a paracrine interaction and the diffusible proteins are called as paracrine factors or growth and differentiation factors or GDFs. So, juxtacrine as well as paracrine they induce they or they uh, uh, exert their induction by the or through the signal transduction pathways. So, in the signal transduction pathway a signal there is a receptor present on the responder and they receive this juxtacrine or a paracrine signal, there is a conformational change in the receptor protein and the change is basically this is conveyed to the cytoplasmic side of the receptor protein and there is a phosphorylation of certain molecules that occur and then there is a cascade of events you know signaling events and finally, it will phosphorylate or it will alter the transcription factors activating them or inhibiting them therefore, causing the activation or inhibition of the certain specific gene expressions which is there. So, both the kind of signals from an inducer to a responder will lead through will act through the signal transduction pathways in the responder cell and therefore, it will become determined and differentiate to become certain precursor cells which is there. So, now let us look at the inductive interactions in amphibians and the major experiments were done by the scientists Speeman and Mangold and we will quickly look at all these experiments. In 1903, Speeman demonstrated that early nude blastomers have identical nuclei 
each capable of producing the entire larva. So what he did was that at the second cleavage divisions, he tied a, a hair uh, hair uh, in the in the direction you know in at the cleavage furrow of the first division and divided it into two parts and kind of you know created a constriction and this constriction therefore uh, put all the nuclei on the one side and there was no nuclei on the other side as you can see so this is the eight cell stage and he tied this ligated this by the uh, his silk hair then at around 16 cell stage one of the nuclei will probably pass through the other side and when this nuclei will pass through here, the development of the cleavages will start here only and then he tightened this ligature so then there is no more transfer of the nucleus which is there. And as you can see that two entire larvae were developed although one was a little smaller because it was growing slowly but entire two larvae were could be developed which was there. So each nucleus has the potential to give rise to the entire larva which is there. When Speeman performed a similar experiment with the constriction still longitudinal but perpendicular to the plane of the first cleavage separating the future dorsal and ventral region rather than giving to the right and left side only one side the future dorsal side of the embryo gave rise to a normal larva. The other side produced an unorganized tissue mass of ventral cells which Speeman called the pot stick the belly piece. This tissue mass was a ball of epidermal cells containing blood and mesenchyme, mesoderm and gut cells but no dorsal structure such as nervous system, notochord or the somites. So you can see here what he did in this particular case was that he tied this lasso so that the future dorsal side and the future ventral side were separated. Where the dorsal side was there it gave rise to the normal larva however the ventral side which was separated gave rise to only the belly piece. The first cleavage pane normally splits and you know why these results were dis different he could find out by the fate map of the egg embryo and he looked at it and found that the first cleavage plane normally splits the grey crescent into two blastomeres. But when he tied in this manner then the grey crescent was only present in the uh, dorsal side however there was no grey crescent region which was found in the ventral side. So should this cleavage be aberrant when these two blastomeres are separated only the blastomere containing the grey crescent develops normally. So he speculated that this grey crescent is an important area and probably it contains certain cytoplasmic determinants which has the potential to give rise to the normal and uh, normal embryo. So the fate map of the amphibian egg showed that the grey crescent region give rise to the cells that initiate gastrulation. And you know we have already talked about the gastrulation early development up to gastrulation in amphibians and you know that you know when the grey crescent area is the point is the, is the region where the gastrulation initiate and these cells form the dorsal lip of the blastopore. So this dorsal lip of the blastopore is basically the uh, the point where the gastrulation starts and the lead and the part of the blastomere which was received this grey crescent gave rise to the normal development. However, the part which lacked this grey crescent there was no gastrulation that could be initiated and therefore there was normal development was lacking. In 1918 Speeman demonstrated that enormous changes in cell potency do indeed take place during gastrulation. So what he did was he transplanted this was the fourth kind of experiment after the defect experiment, isolation experiment, recombination experiment. The fourth kind of experiments which the embryologists do is the transplantation experiment when they, when a when a tissue from one of the uh, host is taken up and uh, it is uh, grafted onto the recipient, uh, uh, recipient uh, structure and then it is the cell lineage is followed. So he performed this transplantation experiment in early and late gastrula and as you can see the early nude gastrula cells were not yet committed to a specific fate. He took a region of the presumptive neural ectoderm and he placed this or grafted this on the recipient uh, uh, early gastrula at the region which is basically presumptive epidermis and when you will see the epidermis follows only form. So neural ectoderm the potential the cells which had the potential to give rise to neural ectoderm actually gave the epidermis because it was uh, it was grafted at the region which is going to develop into presumptive epidermis. So basically they were not yet committed to a specific fate such cells are said to exhibit as we talked about the regulative or the dependent development because their 
ultimately fate depend on their location in the embryo. How exam uh, however, the transplantation in the late gastrula, if he performed the same experiments, but when the late gastrula, the fate could not be changed and the presumptive neural ectoderm gave rise to the neural plate tissue only, although it was grafted onto the epidermal ectoderm region. The late gastrula rather than differentiated in accordance with their new location exhibited autonomous or independent or mosaic development, their prospective fate was determined and the cells developed independently of their new embryonic location. Hans Peeman and Hyde Mangold further perform experiments in 1924 and showed that of all the tissues in the early gastrula, only one has its fate determined and that was the dorsal lip of blastopore. So, what they did was he they uh, grafted when the dorsal lip of an early uh, taniatus gastrula was removed and implanted into the region of an early cristatus gastrula fated to become ventral epidermis. The dorsal lip tissue invaginated just as it would normally have done showing self-determination and disappeared beneath the vegetal cells. So, the all the part of the early gastrula was not uh, this uh, was not undergoing the regulative development but the part which is basically the dorsal lip of blastopore if that was transplanted onto a separate region it gave rise to the another kind of invagination and another specification occurred and then you can see there is a primary invagination and there is a secondary invagination so these two species are particularly important because they show pigmented cells and you know one can easily visualize the different pigmented cells of the both the uh, donor and the uh, host graft. The pigmented donor tissue then continued to self differentiate into the corda mesoderm and the other mesodermal structure that normally form from the dorsal lip as the new donor derived mesodermal cell moved forward. Host cells began to participate in the production of the new embryo becoming organs that normally they never would have formed and the dorsal lip cells were able to interact with the host tissues to form a complete neural plate from the host ectoderm eventually a secondary embryo formed face to face with the host. So, this is kind of a conjoint embryos were formed, they were joined together but that gave rise to both the embryos together and therefore it was basically that this dorsal lip of uh, blastopore had the fate determined which was there. And Speeman referred to the dorsal lip cells and their derivatives the notochordal precordal mesoderm as the organizer and organizer because they induce the host's ventral tissue to change their fates to form a neural tube and dorsal mesodermal tissue such as somites and they organize the host and donor tissues into a secondary embryo with clear anterior posterior and dorsal ventral axis. During normal development the dorsal lip cells organize the dorsal ectoderm into a neural tube and transform the flanking mesoderm into the anterior posterior body axis. The interaction of the corda mesoderm and the ectoderm is not sufficient to organize the entire embryo rather it initiates a series of sequential inductive events which are there. So, this key induction wherein the progeny of dorsal lip cells induce the dorsal axis and the neural tube is traditionally called as primary embryonic induction and all rest of the inductions which give rise to you know organize the entire embryo they are termed as the secondary embryonic induction. This is traditionally called as primary embryonic induction because we further see that this is not the first induction that occurs that you know the dorsal lip cells is inducing the dorsal but organizer itself is also induced. So, but traditionally we call this the development uh, of the dorsal lip cells or uh, the dorsal lip cells that induce the dorsal axis and the neural tube to be the primary embryonic induction and rest of the inductive processes are called as the secondary embryonic induction. In the amphibian early gastrula, the dorsal lip of blastopore is the only region which has its fate determined or it undergoes the autonomous specification. 
the rest of the cells undergoes conditional specification and are in induced. This dorsal lip of blastopore was called as by Speeman and Mangold the organizer. So, in this particular session, we will look at the properties of the uh, organizer and how it is induced. Then we will understand the induction of the neural ectoderm. We will understand the formation of the neural tube and we will understand the defects that occurs in the formation of the neural tube which is there. So, the properties of the organizer is the ability to self differentiate a dorsal mesoderm, the precordal plate and the corda mesoderm etcetera and the ability to dorsalize the surrounding mesoderm into paraaxial or somite forming mesoderm when it would otherwise form the ventral mesoderm. So, organizer is basically that is self differentiating to give rise to the dorsal mesoderm and in fact induces the ventral parts also to become the dorsalize in structure. Then it has the ability to dorsalize the ectoderm inducing the formation of the neural tube which we will follow in detail. Then it has the ability to initiate the movements of gastrulation. So, these are the four important properties of the organizer. Now, we will look into a little detail about how does the organizer is formed. The organizer cells reside above a spe special group of vegetal cells. So, precursor endodermal cells, the vegetal cells are the cells that induce the formation of this organizer. And this was evidence was given by the experiments of New Coop and Nikamura. The properties of newly formed mesoderm were induced by the vegetal or presumptive endodermal cells underlying them. So, what they did was that for example, if you can see they separate this marginal cells then it will give rise to the mesodermal tissue. The animal cap will give rise to the ectodermal tissue and the endodermal or the vegetal cell was give rise to the endodermal tissue. So, this is basically a dissected blastula fragments that give rise to different tissues in the culture. If however, this marginal cells are removed and the animal cap cells and vegetal cells comes into contact with each other then these vegetal cells will induce the animal cap cells to form mesoderm rather than ectoderm. So, animal and vegetal fragments will give rise to the mesoderm and this was because of the factors released from the vegetal cells. The dorsal most vegetal cells of the blastula which are capable of inducing the organizer have been called the new coop center. So, this is the organizer region and these vegetal cells which has the capacity to induce the organizer are basically termed as the new coop center and otherwise also there are mesodermal inducing signal which are there. So, transplantation experiments on 64 cell amphibian embryo demonstrated that the vegetal cells underlying the prospective dorsal blastopore lip region are responsible for causing the initiation of gastrulation. And in this case what was done was that there is a normal donor and there is an UV irradiated recipient. This UV irradiated recipient will give rise to a uh, will not give rise to a normal uh, normal embryo, but just will give rise to that ventral embryonic piece that lacks the body axis. However, if this UV irradiated recipient there was a transplantation which was done and this region you know the vegetal endodermal cell the precursor vegetal endodermal cell was taken another piece was removed from this and this was transplanted here then both of them in this in case of normal give rise to normal development in fact the UV irradiate rate recipient also gave rise to the normal uh, embryo. Another experiment in which there was a normal donor and normal recipient and this normal donor vegetal cells was transplanted onto the normal recipient then it has its own normal recipient uh, region and the other coming from the donor then it give rise to a new gastrulation site and the body axis is formed and such kind of a embryo is giving uh, is given rise to. So, this is basically what tells us that you know these endodermal the vegetal endodermal cells induce the formation of the normal embryo or induce the formation of the or induce the uh, uh, formation of the organizer. Now, looking at how does this new coop center arise is basically uh, we will just review the cortical rotation that occurred after fertilization. So, you know why the one thing we have now understood it that the vegetal endoderm is inducing the organizer and the organizer is giving right to the dorsal lip of the blastopore, but why at that particular location this dorsal lip of blastopore is formed. So, why only at the dorsal position it basically is formed. 
So this is the point of sperm entry and we have already seen there is a cortical cytoplasm, there is a mid middle cytoplasm and there is a cortical rotation that occur that exposes this kind of a grey crescent region. And this grey crescent region is the place where the initiation of the or the lip of the blastopore is formed. And looking at the different uh, proteins which are the, the, the distribution of the proteins, it tells us that the accumulation of certain kind of proteins specifies the location of the origin of this dorsal lip of blastopore. So there is a protein which is termed as disheveled protein which is lying in the vegetal part of the uh, of the developing embryo. Then after fertilization when the cortical rotation occur, this disheveled protein comes and lies in the marginal zone. So this disheveled protein is, rele is released and there is a kind of a gradient that is formed. So there is a dorsal enrichment of disheveled protein which is there. Another protein which is distributed in the cell is the GSK3 beta cell and this GSK3 beta cell, the, this heveled protein basically inhibits the action of GSK3 beta. GSK3 beta is acting upon the beta catenin which is distributed in the cell and this beta catenin is otherwise stable. So GSK3 causes the degradation of the beta catenin. So because of GSK3 getting inhibited by the disheveled protein only in the dorsal part, the beta catenin is stable here. So you can see that these particular uh, blastomeres will only have the uh, production of the beta catenin protein because the GSK3 in here. So there is a kind of a gradient that has occurred and in this particular area in the ventral position there is no beta catenin in the nuclei. And on the dorsal side, the beta catenin. So this specifies that this is the beta, the presence of the beta catenin specifies that this is the region which is going to become the dorsal and here is the region where the organizer is induced. In fact, beta catenin can complex with TCF3 other uh, transcription factors to form a transcription factor complex that can activate the transcription of two other genes which are called as CMS and twin genes. CMS and twin proteins with uh, transcription factor TGF beta can activate a lot of genes. The important gene is the guscoid gene in the organizer. The beta catenin with the other transcription factors activate cordin and several other genes that encode paracrine factors and paracrine factor inhibitors that mediate the functions of the organizer. So you can see that there is an, uh, there is an higher concentration of beta catenin on the dorsal side and there is a TGF beta signal. So at the overlap in the vegetal endodermal region, there is a dorsal beta catenin accumulation and along with the TGF beta signal, this forms the new coop center and this will induce the cells above it, the mesodermal cells and the dorsal mesodermal cells or the corda mesodermal and pharyngeal endodermal cells to become the, the first cells of the dorsal lip of the blastopore and the gastrulation will be initiated. So this gradient of the proteins and the mRNA is basically specifies the position of the new coop center, specifies the position of the organizer and then this organizer will induce the other tissues to become, the, uh, to become uh, their own precursor cell which is there. So we will follow up the formation of the neural tube or basically how the neural ectoderm is determined. A portion of the dorsal ectoderm is specified to become neural ectoderm and its cell becomes distinguishable by their columnar appearance. This region of the embryo is called as the neural plate. The process by which this tissue forms a neural tube, the rudiment of the central nervous system is called as the neurulation. And an embryo undergoing such changes is called as a neurula. The neural tube will form the brain anteriorly and the spinal cord posteriorly. So we will follow that how the specification of the dorsal ectoderm will uh, to the neural ectoderm will occur and then from this neural ectoderm how the neural tube will be formed or the mechanism of neurulation that occurs. Now there are two major ways of converting a neural plate into a neural tube. One is the primary neurulation in which the cells surrounding the neural plate direct the neural plate cells to proliferate, invaginate and pinch off from the surface to form a hollow tube and secondary neurulation in which the neural tube arises from the coalescence of mesenchyme cells into a solid cord that subsequently form cavities that coalesce to create a hollow tube. In general, the anterior portion of the neural tube is made by primary neurulation while the posterior portion of the neural tube is made by the secondary neurulation. 
the complete neural tube forms by joining these two separately forms tubes together. So that is how the entire neural tube is formed. But before we do the uh, you know the detailed mechanism of primary neurulation and secondary neurulation, we will follow the specification of the dorsal ectoderm to form the neural ectoderm. So the induction of neural ectoderm, there is a role of BMP inhibitors which is there. In 1933, scientists by the name of Hans Holfretter showed that if amphibian embryos are placed in a high salt solution, the mesodermal, mesoderm will evaginate rather than invaginate. So these experiments were done basically now we know that there is an organizer and this organizer induces the formation of the uh, of the neural ectoderm. But you know what are the factors, what are the molecules that probably this organizer is releasing that is causing the dorsal ectoderm beca to become the neural ectoderm. Because the ectodermal region lying above this dorsal lip of blastopore is what develops into the neural ectoderm whereas the rest of the ectoderm give rise to the uh, epidermal ectoderm. So is the organizer releasing some molecules to, to do this, this experiment for example was performed in which the amphibian embryo was placed in high salt solution. The mesoderm will evaginate rather than invaginate and will not underlie the ectoderm. And since the ectoderm is not underlain by the notochord, the neural structures are not formed. So basically telling that the mesoderm is or the mesoderm, you know the, the coda mesoderm which is there is inducing the formation of the neural ectoderm. That was their conclusion which was there. Further evidence for soluble factors came from the transfilter studies. The new dorsal lip tissue was placed on one side of a filter fine enough so that no processes could fit through the pores and competent gastrula ectoderm was placed on the other side. Neural structures were observed in the ectodermal tissue. So when the uh, dorsal lip tissue was placed on the one side and the neural structure, the competent neural structure was placed on the other side, dorsal ectoderm, then the neural structures were formed after certain hours, further emphasizing that there are some molecules which are playing a role. However, these molecules were uh, deciphered after a long, long time and in fact it was found that the scientists were going uh, basically a wrong way to find out these molecules and the molecular studies on induction revealed that basically it is the epidermis that is induced to form and not the neural tissue. So by default the dorsal ectoderm is going to form the nervous tissue but the induction by the mesoderm or induction by the notochord will give uh, will uh, by the mesoderm will make them into the epidermal ectoderm which is there. The ectoderm is induced to become epidermal tissue by binding bone morphogenetic proteins or BMPs. The nervous system forms from that region of the ectoderm that is protected from the epidermal induction. So basically the default fate of the ectoderm is to become the neural tissue. Certain parts of the embryo induce the ectoderm to become epidermal tissue by secreting the BMPs. The organizer tissue acts by secreting molecules that block the BMPs thereby allowing the ectoderm protected by these BMP inhibitors to become the neural tissue. So basically the ectoderm has to become the neural tissue but the region where the you know not the dorsal region where the organizer is there the BMP acts on this dorsal ectoderm to induce the formation of epidermal ectoderm but where the organizer is there right above it the ectoderm the, uh, the BMP inhibitors are present and it inhibits the induction of the epidermal ectoderm and therefore the dorsal ectoderm will give rise to the neural ectoderm which is there. The three of the major BMP inhibitors secreted by the organizer are noggin, cordin and folistatin. So this is the role of BMP inhibitors in the specification of the neural ectoderm. So now we will follow up the mechanism of the formation of the uh, neural tube. The primary neurulation, the process divides the original ectoderm into three sets of cells, the internally positioned neural tube which will form the brain, brain and the spinal cord, externally positioned epidermis of the skin and the neural crest cells. So you can see this is the neural plate which is formed the inter and this neural plate will finally give rise to the this kind of a neural tube which is covered by the epidermis and in between there are the neural crest cells and then there is a hollow tube like structure which will differentiate to give rise to the brain and the spinal cord which is there. 
So, primary neurulation can be divided into four distinct but spatially and temporally overlapping stages. First is formation of the neural plate, shaping of the neural plate, bending of the neural plate to form the neural groove and closure of the neural groove to form the neural tube. So, the first is the formation of the neural plate underlying the dorsal mesoderm and the pharyngeal endoderm in the head region signals ectodermal cells above it to elongate into columnar neural plate cells. So, the ectodermal cells above the organizer region where the pharyngeal endoderm and mesodermal cells are there, dorsal mesodermal cells are there, they will induce the cells, ectodermal cells above them to become columnar in the shape and they will give rise to this kind of a neural plate which is there. The neural plate is shaped by the movements of the epidermal and neural plate regions and lengthens along the anterior posterior axis. Neural plate lengthens and narrows by convergent extension intercalating several layer of cells into the few. The bending of the neural plate involves hinge regions where the neural plate contacts the surrounding tissue. So, this is a kind of a hinge region which is there called as the MHP or the major hinge region protein which is there and this hinge uh, uh, proteins which are there will give rise to the uh, interaction between the neighboring cells. So, you can see this is the notochord, notochord and above this notochord this ectoderm is forming the neural plate and then bending of this neural plate is occurring at this particular hinge region. So, MHP cells at the midline of neural plate are derived from portion of NP just anterior to Henson's node. MHP cells become anchored uh, uh, to notochord and form a hinge which forms a furrow at the dorsal middle line. Notochord induces MHP cells to decrease their height and become the wedge shaped. So, they will decrease in size and therefore, it will give rise to this kind of a furrow which is there. So, the neural plate formation and then there is a neural furrow formation which you can see very clearly out here that there, there is a furrow formation which is there. Thereafter, two other hinge regions form furrows near the connection of the NP with the remainder of the ectoderm. So, this neural plate ectoderm is connected to this epidermal ectoderm which is there and at this particular region two other hinge regions which are called as the dorsolateral hinge proteins. These are uh, basically anchored to the ectoderm and they causes the folding at these particular the fold the cleavage the uh, folding furrows to occur at these two positions also. These are the two positions which are shown here. Each hinge act as a pivot that detects that directs the rotation of the cells around it. Surface ectoderm pushes towards the midline of the embryo providing another motive force for the bending of the neural plate. So, this kind of a force is exerted which will cause further bending of this neural plate and therefore, it will assume this particular kind of a shape. So, you can see there is a convergence that is occurring and these are the dorsolateral hinge proteins and they are pushing these two regions to come up to this side and therefore, this groove is further enhancing. Neural tube closes as the paired neural folds are brought together at the dorsal midline. The folds adhere to each other and the cells from the two folds merge. So, then ultimately these folds they come together and the cells of these folds will merge and this neural tube will basically be separated from this epidermal ectoderm by the neural crest cell. So, some of the cells will just remain here. This is the neural crest which will the tube will close itself and the epidermal ectoderm which is basically coming from the neural folds will now fuse together to give rise to the covering of this called as the epidermal ectoderm which is there. So, closure of the neural tube does not occur simultaneously throughout the ectoderm. In amniotes, induction in the head starts before induction in the trunk. So, in 24 hour chick embryo, neurulation in syphilic region is well advanced while the caudal region is still undergoing gastrulation. So, this is shown in the case of chick. So, in the, caudal, in the cephalic region, the neurulation is already formed and in the caudal region, it is still going on and you can see the regression of the primitive streak is there and Henson's node has reached here and the fold. So, you know it has already fused together and they are just folding, they are starting to fold. So, there is a differentiation in the uh, cephalic and the caudal region neutral, neural tube formation which is there. 
So in chick neural tube, closure is initiated at the level of future midbrain and zip up in both directions. In mammals, however, the neural tube closure is initiated at several. So this is in case of a mammalian system. So these are the neural folds which are formed and they will basically close at three distinct points, three different places and then along the anterior posterior axis and the entire neural tube is then closed and formed. We will just look at certain neural tube defects also at this stage where the various parts of the neural tubes fail to close. So there are two pores, the anterior neuropore and the posterior neuropore which are basically the opening of the neural tube on the anterior and the posterior side respectively. Failure to close the human posterior neural tube regions at day 27 or the subsequent rupture of the posterior neuropore shortly thereafter results in a condition called as the spina bifida. The severity of which depends on how much of the spinal cord remains exposed. So because it is not closed, it does not come to lie under the epidermis and the region which is just thus exposed is termed as the spina bifida. Failure to close the anterior neural tube regions resulted in a lethal conditions called as the anencephaly. Here the forebrain remains in contact with amniotic fluid and subsequently degenerate. The fetal forebrain brain development ceases and the vault of the skull fails to form. So you can see this is the encephaly where the vault of the skull fails to form and there is a, it is a lethal condition. The failure of the entire neural tube to close over the entire body axis is termed as the craniorachysis. So these are the different defects because of the neural tube closure malfunctions that can occur. So primary neurulation in amphibian embryo is also, so in most of the vertebrates the neurulation is similar. We followed the mechanism in case of chick embryo and this particular uh, slide shows the primary neurulation in case of amphibian embryos and as you can see these are the different sections. So these are the transverse section and this is the dorsal subview. So there is a formation of the neural folds and there is a neural groove which is there and these neural folds then close together to form the, they fuse together to give rise to the neural tube that separates in between and this is the epidermal tube which is there. So you can see in the transverse sections also this is the neural plate stage. This is the neural fold stage and this is the neural tube stage in the sections which are formed. So in this way the primary neurulation occurs in case of amphibian embryo. Secondary neurulation involves the segregation of the cells of the prospective medullary cord from the cells of the prospective epidermis and prospective gut tissue. Condensation of these mesenchymal cells forms the medullary cord beneath the surface ectoderm. Cavitation of the central portion of the cord. So as we have already talked about the primary neurulation and secondary neurulation are two separate uh, processes and primary neurulation usually occur in the anterior part and the uh, secondary neurulation occurs in the caudal part. So in the caudal part basically there is a segregation of the cells of the medullary cord that occur the pro and give uh, from the cells of the prospective epidermis and the gut tissue and then the condensation occurs and then the cavitation occurs. Then there is a collation of all these cavities into a single central cavity. So we can see the secondary neurulation in caudal region of the chick embryo. So these are the mesenchymal cells, they condense to form the medullary cord at the most caudal end of the chick tail bud. So this is the medullary cord, these are all the sections basically from the caudal region of the chick embryo. So there are the mesenchymal cells, they condense to form this medullary cord which is there and then the medullary cord at a slightly more anterior portion in the tail bud. So this is basically, this is the chick tail bud section through that and this is basically a chick tail, it's a little above the tail bud region, more anterior portion and you can see then again there is a, a mesenchymal cell condensation and kind of a medullary cord is formed here. The neural tube is cavitating and, uh, and the notochord is forming. So further you can see that this kind of there is a cavity that is appearing in this mesenchymal cord which is developing and underlying this particular neural tube is the notochord which is there. And then ultimately the lumens coalesce. So now this lumen is coalescing with the primary cord which is so different different cavitation is occurring 
and ultimately the lumens coalesce to form the central canal of the neural tube and finally this primary neurulation and the secondary neurulation so the two tubes formed by the primary as well as the secondary neurulation will coalesce together to give rise to the neural tube which is there so this is only one of the mechanism which we have followed the formation of the neural tube and this is why, why because we have to understand the cell specification that how does the specification occurs then how the cells are committed and then how the cells are uh, differentiated then after this the neural tube will be differentiated into the brain and the spinal cord and the different regions of the brain will be differentiated so this way the specification of the ectoderm will give rise to so this ectoderm is now induced by the organizer so cell cell communication is very important in the developmental in, in the developmental stages and in the development of the embryo uh, particularly in conditional specifications or regulative development uh, in regulative development because there are cell cell interactions even if a blastomere is removed then these can give rise to the entire uh, larva which is there or entire embryo which is there now this regulative development as we have seen that most of the development regulative development is uh, in the initial stages or in the early gastrula stages after that when this specification has occurred then comes the commitment and in this commitment when the cells are determined to found form a particular uh, particular precursor cell then it is an irreversible phenomena so starting from the you know uh, the specification of the dorsal ectoderm to form the neural ectoderm that's all right that the mesoderm will induce or the dorsal lip of blastopore the mesodermal cells will induce the formation of the dorsal ectoderm into the neural ectoderm by the by bmp inhibitors we have seen so this neural ectoderm is the specification part the neural ectoderm will give rise to undergo primary neurulation to give rise to the neural cells or neuroblasts in which this neural tube is formed there are neural crest cells which is there and then ultimately the differentiation will occur when this neural tube will differentiate into the brain region and the spinal cord region so that is how basically any pluripotent cell of the epiblast or the blastula stage give rise to the uh, precursor cell any uh, particular or a certain precursor cell for example we have followed the specification of the neuroblast in this case and the formation or determination of the neural tube which is there so this is the entire concept of embryonic induction and taking an example of the neural tube formation which is there thank you ma'am thank you so very much and dear friends we believe that this lecture would appear to be very very beneficial for you uh, we would be uploading this lecture on youtube very soon for you so that you can see the lecture the number of times you wanted and and afterwards if you feel there is uh, some question to be answered then you can mail us at info.cc at the rate and ic dot in your feedbacks are very very important so keep watching us and keep writing us we would be meeting again soon and would be discussing on another topic under the series development biology till then take care goodbye thank you ma'am Thank you so very much.